homeowners. Thank you. All right. or comments about the homework. It's due tonight for the end of the day. So questions or comments? No? Yeah. Uh, yes. So the number four, mm -hmm. uh, does it have to like there's no value, yeah, you don't, you don't need that. What is that for? That for? So, you know, for things like the sun and the earth that we can study kind of well, um, you know, you can estimate what the pressure is going to be at the center. But for things that are really far away, like a neutron star, we don't really know. So we actually have to um, use you know, physical models like the one that is that that would be right. So you can calculate the the um, minimum pressure at the center. For you know, most bodies, it's going to be um, maybe an order or two orders of magnitude higher than that. So for the Earth, um, I got like. 40 GPA, and the best known value, you know, based on um, measurements from uh, um, seismology, it's about 400 GPA, so it's an order of magnitude. So for the homework, you have an asteroid, uh, an exoplanet that is similar to the Earth, um, a gas giant, uh, Brown dwarf, uh, main sequence star, then a giant star, uh, white dwarf, and the uh, neutron star. And you can use the same physics you know, to derive the, or to, to get an idea of what the pressure is um, in the center of that body. So that's kind of cool. All right, so. Um, quick review from last week. We um, we derived this equation. So the pressure. And this is for uh, hydrostatic for hydrostatic equilibrium of um, some force that we call a, a buoyant force that produces some pressure with a radius gradient and it opposes the uh, it opposes gravity. So for the different bodies in the homework, these pressure is produced by different forces. Um, but they nevertheless, you know, all of them reach hydrostatic equilibrium. So they just, you know, they exist uh, with that mass and with that radius. So we saw that we need a pressure gradient to, um, to have hydrostatic equilibrium. And we also derive This inequality. So, which is the one that you use uh, for that particular homework problem? So, this inequality is actually pretty interesting. So, another thing that you can do with it. 
So what happens if you have a, let's say, a, a star like the sun, and it suddenly um, uses all the, uh, uh, the nuclear fuel in its core? So it fuses all the hydrogen into helium. What will happen to the core? Well, it collapses, right? So if the if you want to maintain this pressure, well, I guess this pressure is going to drop at the core. Uh, the mass is the same. What happens to the radius? We can't see from here. Better? That's a little better, thank you. It increases. Is that what's going to happen to the sun when uh, when it uh, this is all its uh, hydrogen? It becomes a red giant, right? And so you know, this this uh, inequality tells you that story. Which I think is, is pretty cool. So this is like completely independent uh, of the actual physical phenomenon that is causing the, the pressure. Um, and if it collapses fast enough, you know, if this drop in pressure uh, is really um, abrupt, then this will actually explode. Right? So you have a supernova. So this, with this equation, you can describe um, a lot of phenomena. So it's a uh, phenomenon, so it's very, very general. So, all right. Let's see. This is going to be my eraser. Hmm? The what about it? We, we didn't derive it. Mm -mm. So it's just any force that opposes gravity. All right, so now we're going to look a little bit more into that force. So the pressure, you can imagine, you know, if you have a your box, <coughs> and you have all the, all the particles inside the box, they're going to be um, colliding with the walls, right? You have a bunch of them. So then uh, we also said that the pressure is uh, proportional to the energy density. So if you increase the energy of these particles, what's going to happen to the number of collisions against the wall <clears throat> per, per unit time? It's going to increase. And also the the velocities are going to be higher, right? So the change in momentum over here is going to be larger. So you have more force, and you have a bunch of these, right? Like um, each particle. So what happens to the pressure as you increase the energy? It has to increase. So they are proportional. We, we derived that um, more rigorously, but it's good to have um, this idea. So we saw that the proportionality constant between the pressure and the energy density is 1 over gamma minus 1. And, you know, of course, this is a proportionality constant. It can be any constant, but we saw that putting it in this form was nice because then you can characterize um, the particular phenomenon that is causing the pressure using this gamma. So gamma for the ideal gas was 5 thirds. Gamma for 
radiation, pure radiation, was four thirds. And we also derived um, expressions for the kinetic energy, epsilon, and the gravitational potential energy, uh, omega. They were minus E gamma minus four, and this one was e to the gamma minus one, gamma minus four thirds. So what was nice about this form of representing um, the pressures or the, the pressure energy relationship of these two components is that you can see that for radiation, this blows up. So you cannot have a body that is composed of pure radiation. You need some matter. Um, and when you have only matter, so like the ideal gas, then you have, you recover the, uh, the virial theorem. And From the virial theorem, we saw that if you have a cloud that is isolated, a cloud of dust or gas, it's going to be uh, emitting radiation, so its temperature is going to go down, its kinetic energy is going to go down. And so eventually the total energy is going to be negative, so it's going to be gravitationally bound, it's going to start to form um, something, it could be a planet, it could be a star. So in a way, you know, the uh, formation of stars is kind of inevitable. But the, the physics over here is very general. So it applies to um, you know, a cloud of, of dust in which you have you know, small particles. But it also applies to systems that have um, big particles like stars, uh, and that are composed of stars, such as uh, clusters, uh, you know, globular clusters, or, or galaxies. So the formation of galaxies and the formation of stars, you know, they follow the same physics, which you know, is pretty, it's pretty neat, I think. So um, do you think that these physics applied at the very beginning of the universe, so right after the Big Bang. So the weird thing there that is kind of um, you're not really not really known is what happened with the expansion of space. Right? Like if you had started with absolute space and then you had all the matter uh, somewhere and it exploded will have been exactly the same. Uh, there are some other uh, energetic contributions like um, dark energy from the expansion of the actual space. But, you know, probably after a few minutes after the Big Bang, uh, this falls um, completely. And, well, I guess we'll see that later. Okay, so the pressure depends on um, on the temperature, as we saw with the box. So if you increase the uh, the energy density, um, the average energy of a particle is the temperature. So it depends uh, on the temperature. So if you want to uh, have more details about you know know more about um, about um, um, the hydrostatics of stars, you need an equation that tells you the pressure in terms of the temperature. So how is energy uh, moved around in the star? So that's what we're going to see today.
So there are three ways that heat or that that heat can flow or that energy can be transferred because it is the same thing. Those three methods are three mechanisms are convection, um, this radiation, and conduction. What is each one? What is conduction? Right. So if I put my hand, you know, I'm ha I'm hotter than than the table. If I put my hand on the table, there's a uh, there's conduction of heat, right? So how does it happen? Well, you have things that are vibrating, could be a gas or it could be vibrations in a solid. And so um, those collisions are going to um, spread out the kinetic energy. So that's one way. What about convection? What is convection? Usually you have this combination of conduction and you also have to it that's moving. <clears throat> So you can have pure convection. I mean, typically, yes, you're going to have both. So what would be pure convection? The whole thing moves, right? Yeah. So the hot, let's say that you have a bubble of hot air over here, it will just move somewhere else. So the matter moves, the actual matter. What is radiation? <laughs> Well, photons, and usually, what is the interaction with? Uh, how does it? How does radiation interact with matter? Absorption and emission, right? So you will have a photon that can be absorbed by your atom. So that will be radiation, uh, and if there is no matter, then just it moves through uh, um, through space. So, which one do you think is the most important in stars? The main uh, mechanism of uh, moving energy around. Convection. That's a good one. That's the second one. So, radiation or conduction. <clears throat> I mean, I'm thinking radiation doesn't make it too long, too far. There's a bunch of matter that's absorbed, maybe they have absorbed. That's right. But what about conduction? At least from the core to the surface. I think it's the radiation. So you had a point that. <laughs> The radiation is going to be moving around kind of in a uh, randomly. Um, but the pressure is so high in stars that uh, the atoms, you know, like if, if you think about, you know, let's say a, a hydrogen atom, it's going to be ionized. Um, it's actually going to stay kind of what it is for a very long time. So the only way that it has to move energy around is by absorption and emission of radiation. So both of them have a, um, um, what do you call it? Mm. It's like a characteristic length. You know, like what is the average distance that it travels before it interacts with another atom or it finds another atom. For, for this one, it's going to be very short. Convection, yeah. Um, so if you see, if you look at the sun, the pictures of the sun, you can see like all these huge bubbles um, on the on the surface that are convecting um, bubbles, I guess. So we're going to look 
uh, at radiation in a little bit more detail. So, I'm going to introduce to you this guy, L. So this is just letter L. This is going to be um, an energy density, but it's a little different than the E that we used before, because this one is specific to the frequency. So let's let's look at it. Um, huh? What's that? Yes, new. So L is an energy density, energy uh, per volume. And then it's going to be at position X. So X is uh, a vector in uh, three dimensional space and at time t. And this is the energy per volume of photons that are moving or, or that are located uh, in this volume. They have direction um, n hat. Okay, so it's just a, a, a unit vector that tells you in which direction the photons are moving. And these photons have frequency frequency nu. So this is my nu. This is my D. All right, so it's going to let's see. So I'm gonna move this one a little. So imagine that this is you have a sphere over here. Say that it's a you know a star. You have the center of the star, and you have you know, some radius. Let's say that over here you have uh, this is position x. at time t. So this dude over here, it's a solid angle. How do I draw this? Right, so That's the center, and then you have some finite angle, and it creates, you know, depending on how far away um, you're looking at, this uh, the area is bigger, but the solid angle is always the same. 
So it is, it is an area, but it is an infinitesimal area. So it, it, it's becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. So in the limit of very small um, cross section, you only have photons that are traveling um, in a straight line, right? So they're they're parallel to to, the, to this line over here. And at this particular point, you're going to have photons of different frequency. So it could be low frequency, maybe like that, or they could be high frequency. So if you want to measure the energy density, uh, which one's going to have more energy? This one, right? So the one with the shorter wavelength uh, has more energy. So why can you have different energy volume uh, for different frequencies? What can cause that? Well, maybe the most Obvious one will be um, if you have a black body radiation, right? Or some black body radiation. Then the, um, the number of photons, so the energy density, is going to be different for different wavelengths. This is related to the frequency. But are there other mechanisms why you might have different energy density for different frequencies? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what other mechanisms are there? that will result in having different energy uh, densities for different frequencies. Okay. So another one that I can think of is what you were saying, right? Like maybe you have, uh, I don't know, calcium or something. It absorbs a particular wavelength. So then you will have, um, I guess, a higher energy density because it's absorbing all of that. So it depends on the actual um, physical phenomena that you have over there. OK, so in mind L. What we're going to do is that we're going to find all the contributions to that energy density. And then um, we're going to make the change in energy density equal to zero. Uh, if, if that is not the case, then the, the body is not in, in, in equilibrium, right? So for typical stars that are in uh, hydrostatic equilibrium, the energy density for all those things, frequency, position, is not, is not changing. So there are 
um, four phenomena that affect the uh, the energy density. So one is transport. The other one absorption. The other one scattering. And the last one is emission. So what is okay, let's look at uh, so we talked about absorption. What is absorption? How can we how can we describe it? A combination of what? Mm -hmm. So there are um, there are three kinds of absorption: uh, bound free, bound bound, and free free. So bound free, you have um, an electron that is bound to a nucleus, and then it absorbs a photon. And the energy that, I, that it absorbs from the photon um, is enough to make that electron free from its atom, from its ion. So um, what will happen to that free electron later? Well, likely it's going to collide with other electrons. It's going to collide with other um, atoms. And its energy might decrease or might increase in each of these collisions. So at some point, you know, it might have low enough energy that uh, it gets trapped by another ion. So bound bound, the photon is absorbed by by the electron. It moves to a higher um, energy, still attached to the ion. And you know, perhaps it comes down again and it emits the, uh, the photon um, again. So this is uh, interaction between matter and radiation. The most um, important thing, I guess what makes it you know, different from the other ones, is that there is no correlation between the initial uh, momentum of the of the um, of the photon and the photon that eventually gets released again you know so um, maybe the electron traps the photon and then it moves around for I don't know, 30 seconds um, it's colliding with other atoms its motion is completely uncorrelated to the initial vector of the photon and then it gets you know emitted again so there's no correlation. What about scattering? What is the difference between scattering and absorption? So this is like a, an inelastic collision, right? So it is going to interact with the electron, um, but because it is an inelastic collision, the uh, final direction of the photon is related, it's correlated to the initial direction. So these two, you know, are similar except for that. This one is uh, it interacts with the electron, it moves, and then it is released. This one, the the uh, interaction is almost instantaneous. What about emission? How can you emit radiation? How am I emitting radiation right now? 
especially after that run. Hmm? Heat. What, what is producing that heat, that infrared radiation? There is a temperature difference, yes, but um, I will be emitting radiation even if I, uh, if the env environment were hotter than me. So how can you produce uh, a photon with an electron? Accelerating it, right? So am I accelerating electrons in my body? Yeah, in a pretty crappy way. Right? So you, my, my, my atoms are vibrating, not very fast, but that is enough to accelerate um, the electrons, the charges. And so I very slowly produce, or I guess I, I produce a small amount um, of infrared radiation. So if you have a body that is hotter, let's say like the sun, then you know the emission is going to be uh, much more noticeable. Um, but the, the, the sun was not a very good example because um, the sun is also fusing hydrogen. But think about um, the center, the core of Jupiter. What is the temperature over there? It's hot. Huh? Yeah, I think something like 5,000 Kelvin or something. Right? So it's not fusing anything. It's just um, you know, there's a lot of pressure. So um, it has to get hot to support its weight. And so the, the emission is much more important than in my case. So the second case, or the second um, way of emitting radiation is um, a nuclear. So one is nuclear, the other one is thermal. And nuclear, we're going to see it in much more detail uh, later. But yeah, it's what supports uh, stars. So what about this guy, transport? What is it? Hmm? But there is no matter. You need matter for convection. That was close. It was just a, the photon moving, right? So you know, the radiation that we get from the sun is mostly transport. So it leaves the sun, spends eight minutes just chilling, and then it reaches the, uh, the Earth. But in, th in those eight minutes, it doesn't interact with much. So it's just being uh, transported. So we're going to write a few equations that describe these four things. Before I forget, uh, what did you think about the homework? Easy, hard? That was frustrating. Yeah, so for that one, mostly it's about your reading. So was the level okay? Okay. Hmm? Okay, good. So would you want maybe, okay, maybe, maybe I will do this. Um, I will assign five problems and you only have to turn in four in case you want a little bit more challenge. 
You liked it? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I know that some people are a little you know, rusty with the with calculus, and um, but you know, the, I guess the main idea is that you understand some of these fundamental things, like you can assume that everything is at the center of a, a sphere, all the mass. Okay, so. Um, Mm. I don't know how to call this. So I'm going to call it row for now. Okay. It, it is not, it's a general okay. uh, variable. It's not necessarily the density or the mass density. So this is a continuity equation. Right, so this is um, a density of some quantity. It could be an, an energy density, it could be a mass density. Uh, this is some velocity with which whatever you have over here is moving. This is the divergence. Right, so short for um, derivative of whatever you have there respect to x and i. J and so on. Right, this is the time derivative. So if this is zero, what does this equation tell you? And have you seen an equation like this before? Yeah. People in teams? Yeah? What? In, where did you see it? Electrodynamics? Yeah. Oh. Conservation. Charge. Conservation of charge? Yeah, so it could be conservation of anything. Conservation of mass, conservation of charge. Um, so we're going to use, okay, so how do you interpret it? Because you have a time derivative here and a space derivative over here. What would be the interpretation? So, like, so like the change in energy is equal to the energy mm -hmm. the So, how do you visualize the, um, what do you call this? The curl and the oh, divergence. How do you imagine the divergence? <laughs> Just something living, like a sphere. So everything that you put in that sphere um, has to leave if you're going to conserve the amount of quantity in your um, in your volume. So this is just a way to represent uh, conservation. So for transport, The number uh, of photons is conserved. So if 10 photons you know, reach your volume, 10 photons have to leave if you're going to conserve um, the number of, of photons. And uh, if they are not interacting with anything, then they come in, they have to leave. So we can just rewrite this equation 
So this is going to be our friend L. So how the energy density at point X time T for frequency V or uh, nu uh, has to be equal to is the speed of light because photons are moving at the speed of light. Okay, so uh, this is the transport equation. For we can use the same equation for the other three processes. Can you give me an extra 15 minutes or so? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so for absorption, Can you see? Yeah, right. Not the best. Um, so we have this same guy. Um, but the divergence is going to be what? If it is if something is being absorbed. say that it's it's zero so it's just being accumulated there like you're putting more photons uh, but they're not leaving they're being just absorbed um, that has to be equal uh, to something over here which is what is being accumulated so we're going to write it as uh, a fraction of the over here a fraction of the uh, observed radiation um, sorry of the total radiation that is um, moving through that volume. So it's going to depend on the number of absorbers and the number of absorbers is going to be proportional to the density. So you know, this will be atoms, well, most likely. And it is going to be also proportional to the efficiency with which these um, atoms, or whatever you have in there, absorb uh, the photons. So um, it's going to be called kappa. different from my K. Excuse me. Don't get scared. <laughs> um, so it's going to depend on the position, the frequency. We saw that the absorption can be different for different frequencies and the time. And uh, because this efficiency is just a proportionality constant, we can add 
another constant in there, the speed of flight. And you will see why it is nice to have the speed of flight there. So then the fraction uh, of absorption of photons absorb photons it's going to be um, C kappa Rho, uh, also time, and PT. Uh. So That means that that derivative, which in this case, um, again, is going to be of L, the energy density, it's going to be this guy over here times this guy. So that is a fraction. So if you want the absolute number, you need to multiply it again. So C kappa. Okay, and this has some interesting properties. So if you look at the units of kappa, you have uh, meters per second absorption um, coefficient or opacity. Um, this guy is kilo, uh, kilograms per meter cube. And we know that this is a fraction, so it's supposed to be unitless. So, this I can make this a square, like this. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I needed a DT, so there's another second over here. Okay. So, implies that kappa the units are meter per second um, sorry meter squared over kilogram what is that mean 
will be a kilogram per meter squared. Like an area mass density. What about meters squared per kilogram? Hmm? Can you explain it though? Like how much area is covered by the Yep. So in the context of a photon, what does it mean? Say that you're a photon, you're traveling at the speed of light. If kappa is really big, you see a lot of area that is covered for you. So there's a high probability that you're going to get absorbed by that atom. If kappa is low, then this uh, m squared, you know, the, this cross section, is going to be small. And so it is a it is a probability area essentially. Like what is the probability? Maybe one way to look at it is um, you're a photon, and you're going to encounter this green. And if the grid is very dense, so the, the area is very large, and it's very likely that you're going to be absorbed. If it's low, then the grid is sparse, and there's a low chance that you're going to get absorbed. So I mentioned that um, Weinberg said that he likes uh, beautiful theories, and that beautiful for him means from first principles. So is this a fundamental theory or no? Now that cross section is kind of iffy. Is it fundamental? Yeah. Why? There's 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 no physics there. Hmm? So any physical theory that you want to plug in in here, uh, physical the uh, a theory of absorption has to uh, satisfy these equations. So in that sense, it's pretty it's pretty fundamental. Uh, it doesn't tell you what the specific physics are, but it tells you how they should behave. So that's kind of cool. Um, all right, so I guess I will, I will stop there. Just uh, I'll ask one more question. So he's going to put the, uh, the speed of light there so that your absorption kappa has these units and it is a cross section. Um, and also if you take the inverse of kappa, multiply times the inverse of the um, mass density, the units are one over meter. Sorry, it should be meter. Meter. And so that tells you what is the um, average distance that a photon is going to travel in this medium before being absorbed by the medium. All right, so next time we'll look at the other two, uh, emission and, um, and scattering. And we will derive the luminosity as a function of the temperature. So, yes. Yes. You mean uh, in an experiment? Definitely. So, 
Um, if you look, for example, at um, so you can look at the not the absorption, but the scattering cross section of uh, X-rays for different elements. And so for X-rays, the bigger the atom, the bigger the scattering uh, cross section for for the X-ray. For um, for neutrons or for other kind of radiation, uh, you're going to have an absorption and a scattering cross section, and they do not depend uh, at all um, on the size of the atom. So depending on the actual configuration of the nucleus, like how many protons it has, how many neutrons it has, uh, it might be almost transparent to a neutron, or it might get like, you know, uh, absorbed very strongly. So like lead, you know, uh, uh, absorbs neutrons and pretty much everything very strongly. So you use it in, in your labs for protection. Um, but if you want to characterize um, a compound or something, yeah, this is this is a, a legit way to do it. So I guess you can use whatever you have at your disposal for the radiation source, right? So you can have maybe an X-ray machine, or if you have um, like iron um, iron fifty seven which decays into iron 56 with a gamma ray, you can use that. You can go to a national lab and use a, a, how do you call it? Um, a synchrotron source that will like, uh, in the synchrotron, you can actually get exactly the frequency of light that you want. So yeah, cool idea. <laughs> okay, more questions? Nope, great. Questions over here? Not right now. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to uh, upload your homework and participate in the forum. Thank you, hey, Vanessa. Thank you. Bye.